Chapter 14. In McCallus's last postcard to Westerberg, he wrote, If this adventure proves fatal and you don't ever hear from me again, I want you to know you're a great man. I now walk into the wild. Because of this, many people think that he was suicidal and never intended to come out. Krakauer thinks that his death was unplanned based on how McCandless was with others before his adventure and from Krakauer's own personal experience. Krakauer admits to growing up moody and having father issues. Krakauer spent most of his youth climbing various mountains in Alaska and Canada. In 1977, he decided to climb a peak known as the Devil's Thumb. He was 23 and no one had ever climbed its northern wall. He was a carpenter and one day told his boss he was quitting, and that same day he left for Alaska. The Devil's Thumb is outside a village called Petersburg on the Alaska-Canada border. You can only get there by boat or plane. He couldn't afford a plane, so he abandoned his car and hitched a ride on a salmon boat. One night, as he was steering the boat, he saw a mule deer in the middle of the Fitzai Sound, just swimming in the middle of the night. When he got to Petersburg, he didn't know what to do, so he stayed at the library, and a woman, Kai Sandburn, started talking to him and let him stay the night. Croc Howard earlier told himself he didn't mind being alone, but talking and joking with Sandburn made him miss being with other people. To get to the mountain from the village, Krakauer had to find a way across 25 miles of sea and then ski for 30 miles. While skiing, there were deep crevices in the ice, so he had to use shower poles that he tied to his waist. In case he fell, they would hopefully catch the ice. Three days after leaving the village, he made it to the Stikine ice cap. Before he could finish plotting a course, snow began falling to the point where it was hard to see anything. He was lost in the broken ice and at one point tried to cross an ice bridge that broke. Luckily, his shower poles kept him from falling down the crevice. That night, he made it to a clearing and pitched a tent. He planned on spending three weeks on the ice cap, but he didn't want to carry all that food and gear, so he paid $150 to a bush pilot to drop off supplies at the foot of the thumb. He made it to the drop point on May 6, but the plane never came. Finally, on May 10, he heard the plane. The plane, however, was too high to see Krakauer. Luckily, the pilot made a couple passes, knowing how dangerous it would be to leave him alone. The pilot finally saw Krakauer, dropped the supplies, and left. Krakauer felt alone and started to cry. The next day, the weather was clear and warm, so Krakauer made his way to the mountain. The glacier was covered in knee-deep snow and crevices, making the trip very slow and tiring. After about three or four hours, he made it almost to the base of the actual climb, but he was already exhausted. At the face, a sheet of ice covered vertical rock for about 300 feet. He started using his axe to latch on to the two-inch ice and started climbing. The rock itself was some 3,000 feet, almost vertical. After climbing about 700 feet using only his ice axes and crampons, when Krakauer hit 3,700 feet, there was no more ice. There was only rock. He couldn't go up any higher with his axes. He went down a little, but couldn't find another way up. In the end, he had to descend back down the face.